Hey, are you here? If you're here, raise your hand. I see you. Yes, you're here. Since you're here, let me announce the final, the very last show of 2022. Bye-bye, 2022. Welcome to the Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories for more than 19 years. On today's episode, we're pleased and honored to welcome author, political analyst, and commentator Jeffrey Lord. A man with many experiences, Jeffrey Lord was also a former aide to Ronald Reagan and Jack Kemp. You may recognize him from his days as a commentator on CNN. CNN? Uh, That's a TV news network, if you're not aware. Kidding. Just kidding. These days, Jeffrey Lord is a contributing editor to the American Spectator. If you've read his columns, you know how compelling a writer he is. Mr. Lord is top shelf. Hey, just keep in mind that the Paul Leslie Hour is made possible by viewers and listeners like you. No matter the amount, your contribution makes more interviews possible. Simply visit www.thepaulleslie.com slash support. Thanks. Jeffrey Lord has been seen in a lot of places on television, radio, and in print. Well, now let's all listen to Jeffrey Lord here on The Paul Leslie Hour. Hello, hello, and what a magnificent back background you have there. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm in my uh, office at home, and I have uh, all kinds of Reagan paraphernalia, memories, and uh, Trump, and on and on it goes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for your patience. Uh, sure. Quite a, uh, quite a traffic jam, I guess, everybody leaving or coming into <laughs> South yeah. Carolina. I think this is uh, probably true across the country. I have to go, uh, as I was saying to you, I've got to go to Long Island tomorrow, but I'm stopping first in New York overnight because I am uh, guest hosting Sean Hannity's radio show on uh, Thursday. So uh, once that's done, I hop in the car and go the rest of the way out to eastern Long Island. And I frankly expect it will be miserable. (laughs) (laughs) Well, here's hoping it's not so bad but right now to tell everybody you're joining us from the keystone state that it is that i am suburban harrisburg pennsylvania a couple miles from the uh across the river from the state capital of the commonwealth of pennsylvania were you born in pennsylvania no uh my there's a little tale here my parents were from eastern long island and high school sweethearts and all that kind of thing. And, you know, they had that small little interruption in their romance known as World War II. (laughs) And uh, he was off in the Pacific and all of that sort of thing. And when he came back, they got married and they went to work in New York City in the travel business. And then I decided to make an appearance and they decided they didn't want to raise a kid in New York City. And I think they wanted to spread their wings. And so they picked Northampton, Massachusetts, And uh, that's where I arrived. And as I always said to my father, we lived there until I was about uh, not quite 15. My dad was in the hotel business, so we moved a little bit. But as I always told my New York Mets loving father later in life, it's his fault that I grew up a Red Sox fan. (laughs) (laughs) Now, have you always been a man who was unafraid to speak his mind? That comes from my parents. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. My parents were in politics in Northampton. Uh, My dad held Calvin Coolidge's old seat on the Northampton City Council and was the uh, Republican City Committee chairman. My mother was the chair of the Hampshire County Republican Women. And I'm an only child, so young couple that they were, uh, they would, uh, instead of a babysitter, they would cart me around to city council meetings and uh, Republican women's meetings and Republican City Committee and State Committee and state conventions and all that kind of thing. So, you know, I got it from them, really. They were both uh, certainly outspoken. My mother, until she passed at 99, was a uh, a big fan of President Nixon. 
and uh, was was unafraid to say so. And I remember as a kid in my little bedroom off the kitchen, their, their best friends were the upstairs neighbors and landlords who were Democrats. And I remember to the wee hours of the morning, they'd be there going back and forth over uh, Nixon and Harry Truman and Eisenhower and all the all the figures of the day in the 1950s. So uh, definitely it's inherited. Do you have a favorite all-time president? Yeah, I have a couple. One, of course, is my own boss, uh, President Reagan. Um, and then, in spite of my Republican leanings, uh, growing up in the 1960s, I was a huge fan of President Kennedy. And uh, over there, I don't, you can't see it here, but there was a the, the Wyeth family artists, uh, Andrew and son Jamie, um, from Pennsylvania, Jamie Wyeth did a portrait of President Kennedy, and I have a print of it, which I hung in my office in the Reagan White House. And uh, President Reagan was always amused. And at one point, it was it was interesting. You know, presidents are always raising money for their libraries. And of course, President Kennedy was not here to do that. And it's somewhere in there in the Reagan era, John and Caroline Kennedy came to see President Reagan and asked if he would substitute for their father and come to a fundraiser for the library at the home of Senator Ted Kennedy. And he did it. And and he talked about how he had people on his staff who were, you know, big fans of President Kennedy and all of that kind of thing. So so those two in my lifetime. Uh, and then, of course, I add to that uh, President Trump, whom I've become uh, friends with and uh, I thought did a did an outstanding job and uh you know that that's a chapter that has yet to be uh, completed i think interesting so uh, you know we're just at the end of 2022 about to roll into 2023 it promises to be a eventful year already i think do you have any predictions in terms of what we're going to see in the next year well, it's hard. One one thing that I I strenuously disagree with is all of these polls that say person A or B is ahead and Trump over DeSantis or DeSantis over Trump and all of this kind of thing. Uh, if I've learned anything in my political career, it is don't trust the polls. <laughs> right. Uh, generally, uh, one of my favorites was from the 2016 campaign. It was in the New York Times. Uh, it ran on election day of 2016, and the headline was Hillary Clinton has an 85% chance of winning. <laughs> mm. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so uh, I just think, you know, you know, and events can happen. And speaking of President Kennedy, you know, I was quite the political geek when I was a kid and followed this stuff all the time. And I remember vividly going to school. Uh, on a fine November day in, in Massachusetts in junior high school, I was in the seventh grade and um, he was, he, president Kennedy was being matched in polls against uh, both Nelson Rockefeller, the Republican governor of New York and Barry Goldwater, this Republican Senator from Arizona. By the time I came out of school, the word spread that the president had been shot and killed in Dallas. So the whole Kennedy Goldwater, Kennedy Rockefeller scenario just never materialized what i learned from that is you know we never know what's going to happen the next day i'm i'm certainly not uh, predicting uh tragedy here i'm just saying that events happen and those events can change things on a dime and when we're this far out from the you know the actual picking of the president as it begins in 2024 uh, and the nominating convention, man, <laughs> I just, uh, I have no crystal ball on the desk here. <laughs> hmm. I'm very curious to know, it, it hasn't been reported everywhere, but we've been talking a little bit about Kennedy lately. And I'm curious, have you been following all of these things that, for example, Tucker Carlson has been? Uh, yes. Yes. I was very curious about it. I mean, I, I know Tucker a little bit via uh, text and emails, that sort of thing. Um, and we go back and forth. I haven't said anything to him about this. I just am very curious. Uh, I, I mean, 
if you were alive at the time, as I was, and as I say, I was in seventh grade, this is a very vivid, lifelong memory and the controversy that has gone with it. And by chance, last year uh, on my summer vacation, uh, I was with a friend and we went to Boston and, you know, took in a Red Sox game. But then we also went the next day to the JFK Library, which I had never been to, and took a tour of that and found it very fascinating. Then again, by chance, a few weeks later, I went to CPAC's summer meeting, which was in Dallas. And while there, I sucked it up and went to the Texas School Book Depository. And if you've never been, it's a fascinating thing to see. Horrific, but fascinating. And uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was positioned on the sixth floor of the School Book Depository. And you could get there, and they have it sort of walled off with glass or plexiglass or whatever. But you can see exactly there is an open window, and there are, are some boxes small smaller boxes stacked one on another and then larger boxes remember this was a book depository so all these boxes i don't know whether they still do but at the time they held books and and the big boxes shielded him from the view of anybody who would have come into the room at the time and when you look from that window down to the street i guess it was elm street i, <coughs> I forget that's right in front of the building it just isn't that far and that distant. And if you are a Marine sharpshooter, which he was, um, wow, you know, it, this was a fairly easy thing to to do. I saw the grassy knoll and, and they, interestingly, they have a white X painted on the uh, road right where the shot hit, the first shot hit. I don't know. I mean, I, I have always believed that that Lee Harvey Oswald did it himself. I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there was a guy in the day named General Edwin Walker. He was a very right-wing figure. He's retired military, a very right-wing figure. He lived in Dallas. And on one fine evening in April of 1963, a bullet goes crashing into his library window and misses him narrowly. Well, they find out later, after the JFK assassination, that the would-be shooter of General Walker was Lee Harvey Oswald. The slugs that they got matched the rifle that was used to kill the president. Man, you know, this just this, this just started to get more complicated and complicated. And, um, you know, and then, of course, over the years, you would hear these stories about, well, it was the mafia and, and JFK, you know, was with the mafioso's girlfriend and... And then, of course, the mafia was livid with Bobby Kennedy as attorney general because he was going after them and all that. So I've certainly heard them all. And, and the CIA angle, again, I, I'm old enough to remember this. President Eisenhower launched uh, a planning for an invasion of Cuba. And then, of course, he left office and the planning went on. And the CIA director, one Alan Dulles by name, who was the brother of Eisenhower's Secretary of State John Foster Dulles um, convinced JFK to go along with it. The fatal flaw was that once in motion with these Cuban expatriates, as it were, invading Cuba at the Bay of Pigs, as it was known, the fatal flaw was that they suddenly said to JFK, oh, Mr. President, now we need air cover from the US. Well, he declined to give it. And the whole thing blew up. The, the whole episode was an enormous failure and a black eye for the Kennedy administration. And he, you know, would have these regular press conferences and, and uh, he was asked about this and he said, you know, I'm the responsible officer of the government. You know, he took full responsibility for it. But whether that created a lasting CIA loathing of JFK, I honestly don't know. Uh, I know that at some point he relieved Alan Dulles of his um, um, role as, as CIA director and brought in somebody else. So could there be, you know, I, I think back now to Chuck Schumer's observation when Donald Trump was elected that and he was on Schumer was on something like meet the press. 
And he said, he says, don't piss off the intelligence community. They've got 101 ways to get back at you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, wow. Yeah. So I don't know. Tucker obviously has some inside info here. And I'm curious, you know, I just, I just have a feeling we're never going to know the answer to this for sure, definitively, that yeah. we're just going to have, uh, you know, person A believes A and person Z believes Z and everybody in between believes their own thing. And uh, it's not like Abraham Lincoln, you know, where they they got John Wilkes Booth for sure. Everybody saw him. <laughs> right. And do it. And he jumps to the jumps to the stage yelling six Semper Tyr Tyrannus, I guess it was. Right. Be the tyrants and uh, gallops off on a horse and they get him and all of that kind of thing. And there was no doubt about it. And and. Ditto with the other two presidential assassinations uh, of uh, James A. Garfield, who was shot in Union Station, and they got that guy right away. And then uh, the guy who assassinated William McKinley at the Pan Am Exposition in Buffalo, I think it was. And uh, that was an anarchist, as I, as right. I recall. The first one was, a, as they say, a disappointed office seeker. And the second one was an anarchist. So... Uh, it's only the JFK one that is shrouded in in mystery. And, you know, here we are. I can't believe it, but it's 60 years later, just about. And we still don't have a conclusion on this. It's very interesting stuff. You know, on the note of Tucker, a lot of the people watching this, they might be thinking, Jeffrey Lord, I, I've seen this guy on CNN. Uh, I, I would be very curious to know i'm i'm somebody and i told you this on email uh i'm a news junkie i mean yeah. i can watch fox news i can watch cnn i can watch msnbc i can listen to talk radio who out there would you have to give the respect to in the person that impresses you as a commentator or a news journalist well, you know, there's a difference between being a straight out, straight up journalist and being a commentator. <laughs> right. As I said, I'm great friends with Sean Hannity and and he describes himself per perfectly. He says he does journalism on a show. He does commentary. He does uh, all sorts of politics, et cetera. He makes no pretense that he is some sort of uh, objective, uh, you know, as, as journalists tend to want to portray themselves as uh objective and and there's no subjectivity and all that he says that's not what he is he is about and clearly he isn't the thing that always i think gets a lot of conservatives is you've got places like the new york times where they try and convince you that they're about straight up journalism when in fact <laughs> right. they're uh, particularly in this day and age they're pretty far left they used to be just liberal now they're pretty out there and i was writing just the other day about uh uh mentioning all these people at the New York Times that that got their opinion page editor fired or or forced him out because he had the audacity to run a column by Senator Tom Cotton in the summer of 2020 that that called for President Trump to send in the troops to quell the riots in all these American cities and they were outraged and demanded that he be tossed out and he was um that's pretty far left and there's nothing subjective or objective about that you know it used to be i mean and, and I, as far as i know their motto still is all the news that's fit to print but uh it doesn't work that way i mean right now i've seen stories about uh the twitter files not popping up in uh, a lot of these mainstream media outlets well imagine that <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh but you know they're all good. I mean, I'm I'm still friends to this day with Anderson Cooper, whom I got to know while I was on there. And uh, you know, I've been on a lot of these different shows. I'm and I now myself am a Newsmax contributor, so uh, I'm really enjoying that. And and uh, I go on to bring a you know a conservative point of view, and and uh, it's a it's a lot of fun. But journalism is not totally what it used to be and and i think one of the reasons for that is uh the absolute flood of social media and big tech and all of that and you know now you can be 
as Sean says, you can be sitting in your mother's basement in your underwear and have a presence on the internet, uh, you know, going after Sean if you don't like conservatives or going after somebody. And everybody's got that capability in it. Wow, it certainly has changed the world. There's no question about that. I've been really enjoying your columns in American Spectator. And one of the reasons why I wanted to interview you is because reading your work, I get this feeling like you've invited me over to your kitchen and you've (laughs) said, Paul, listen, this is what I think. Have a seat. Have a cup of coffee. I feel very much like you're talking to me. Uh, And I'm just curious, how do you, what's the process when you write one of these columns? How do you do it? Well, one of the things I learned when I worked for President Reagan, somebody asked him, and I was there, asked him about how he he began his career. And he began his career in, uh, I forget whether it was Des Moines or it was in Iowa. And he was uh, a sports broadcaster. And he said that, uh, you know, and he he had a show and everything. And sometimes one of the funny things about it was that in those days you read the score, what was happening in a baseball game on a ticker tape thing. And then suddenly the ticker tape machine would get screwed up. (laughs) And Reagan says he would just make it up as he went along. And there's another ball and another ball and another ball, foul ball, foul ball. ball. And he'd keep doing that until the ticker started up again and he could reveal what was actually happening in the game. But one of the things he said was that I really took note of was that he learned when he sat down behind the microphone And again, this was radio, not television, which really didn't exist to any serious extent in those days. He he would he would actually go to the barbershop every week and and a bunch of guys would sit around and talk about issues of the day. And Reagan said one of the things he learned is not to think that there's X number of millions of people out there listening to his voice, but to talk to one person. Hmm. Like he was in the barbershop and, and it made it more personal and all of that. Well, I thought, well, that's really good advice. So when I write these columns, I'm thinking in my head of, you know, I'm just talking to a person. I'm not talking, you know, on mass, because if you start to talk on mass, you lose people. And uh, one of the other things I learned as I was doing this is it, it is always a good idea uh and i try frequently to to stick with it maybe not always but it's always a good idea to have a person's name in the title of the column and the reason for that is that most people obviously uh, respond to stories about other people you know they're they're not you know you can talk all you want let's say about uh the state of the economy and get very academic about the whole thing. But people aren't paying attention to that. What they want to know is, you know, John Smith pulled up to the gas station and the gas pump and went to get it. And the price of gas had soared a buck since he'd last gotten gas. And, you know, what did this mean for John's wife and his kids and all that kind of thing? So in other words, you make it a story about a person. And one of the things that helped me with this when I got out of government in 1993, and as I always say, you know, I'd been in, I'd worked for a congressman, senator, the winning Reagan campaign for Reagan himself in the White House, and then in the Bush 41 era for Jack Kemp at HUD. And then these people named Clinton came along <laughs> and we all had to leave. So I, I had to, you know, what is it I wanted to do? I didn't want to do a lob, be a lobbyist, et cetera. And I thought, well, I'd like to write, you know, Tom Clancy was very big in the day and all that. And by chance, a bunch of us Kemp folks were having a mini reunion and a couple months later at a, at a bar on Capitol Hill near where I live called Bullfeathers named for Teddy Roosevelt's famous uh, saying. And we're sitting there at a table talking and this young woman comes over who none of us knew and said, is there anybody here who would like to try out for a Bud Light commercial? 
I thought, well, this sounds cool. So I raised my hand. <laughs> uh, they called me and said, be down at the docks in Washington. There's an area in Washington called the docks or the wharf where they have all of these fishing boats tied up permanently and they sell fresh fish, lobsters and, you know, swordfish and whatever, scallops, that kind of thing. So I went down there at the, at the given day and um, my task was they had remade the deck of one of these boats as a bar. And my task was there was a whole crowd of people in front of me. <laughs> and my line was, I I'm trying to get a beer. And I, I keep saying, don't you know who I used to be? Don't you know who I used to be? And that doesn't do anything. And then I say, can I get a Bud Light? And the crowd parts. <laughs> and I get in and I get, a, I get a beer. To this day, I haven't seen the commercial. But out of it, somebody there said, you know, you were pretty good at this. Here's the name of a casting agent. I thought, what the heck? So I went and I started doing extra work in movies, big movies, you know, like the Pelican Brief with Julia Roberts and Denzel Washington and True Lies with Arnold's and, uh, you know, Contact with Jodie Foster and Matthew McConaughey and a few others. But I also thought, you know, I took acting lessons and then I thought, you know, I should learn to write screenplays. So I took screenwriting courses at Georgetown. And the very first one that I wrote in class, the professor said, you know, this is pretty good. You should send it such and such a place. Well, such and such a place turned out to be the Motion Picture Academy. And they had a fellowship program. And they picked, um, uh, there were like 5,000 people that sent in things. I made the list of the final 100. They, they finally picked 10 and i wasn't in the final 10 but what they did do is put the names of all the final 100 in the hollywood trades and i really did get an agent out of it and from that i started writing political stuff uh hence my contact with the american spectator um, and i was getting published in the wall street journal and the washington times and all this and what i didn't quite realize at the time and in retrospect it seems obvious producers of television shows and radio shows are always reading these things to see who said what and what's up, et cetera. And I got my first invite to go on uh, what was then known as Hannity and Combs. Right. On Fox. And uh, I did that. And then the next day, Sean wanted me back on his radio show. And uh, that this was years ago now. And we became friends and all of the heads, you know, I'm going to fill in for him uh, on uh, Thursday. But it really was a learning experience and how to do all of this and how to tell stories to use my what I learned writing screenplays and novels that were all to this moment unpublished. But to zero in on one person and how that relates to whatever it is you are talking about. I have a column today. Um, this story came to my attention and I interviewed the guy. He was a. Uh, <clears throat> a professor, a tenured professor at the University of Scranton in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is a Catholic institution. And uh, the school demanded that everybody be vaccinated. Hmm. Well, he thought it was none of their business whether he was vaccinated or not. And here's the kicker. He was vaccinated, but hmm. he refused to, he felt it was not their business to, to know. So he wouldn't say, and they fired him. And he has now filed a lawsuit and all of this kind of thing. But I thought, wow, you know, what an interesting. So I put, you know, University of Scranton professor in the headline uh, so that people could get it. And, you know, and it's gotten some response here because people are <laughs> appalled that this kind of thing could happen. So, you know, you tell the story and you tell the thing. And I quote from his law, his uh, lawsuit and um uh, you know, how he feels this woke stuff has just gone, you know, way beyond control here and how it has affected him and his life. And, uh, you know, I closed with a quote, speaking of President Kennedy from uh, his Pulitzer Prize winning book, their profiles and courage and about how, you know, it takes courage to stand up for principle and all of that sort of thing. And I thought uh, this professor, Dr. Ben uh, Bishop, by name, uh, is doing just that, and and bravo for him. Looking forward to reading that one. This one, it it's 
kind of an indirect question. There is a very avid viewer and listener of ours in the Keystone State also. John is his name. And he contacted me a couple days ago, and it, there was a question I didn't know the answer to. He said that he finds that the news can be very despairing, and lately more and more so. You know, you even hear about something like this, this column that you're talking about, that someone could lose their job for something so ridiculous. What would you say is the best antidote or the best way of overcoming all the negative news, all of the the things that do kind of result in a feeling of hopelessness? Well, the best thing I could suggest is don't worry about the news. Worry about what you can affect in your life. Um you know, we could all, I suppose, go off on some long uh, discussion about uh, religion. But the main thing for me to do is show up in church <laughs> and work to keep my church in good shape and good financial shape and, you know, all the other, you know, and I've been president of my church council uh, a couple times in the past. Um, and it that's the kind of thing is is work on what you can affect because the rest is out of your control. I mean, you know, I, I could, I mean, there's a thousand different things. I could fume about some political thing uh, writ large, but, you know, what can I do about it? And, you know, at, at the American Spectator and also at Newsbusters, the Media Research Center, where I have a, a media column every Saturday, um, you, you focus on those things and I can have an impact. Uh, I, I hear from President Trump, uh, you know, on occasion when he's read something and sometimes he he puts it out there himself, which is always an amazing, <laughs> always an amazing experience. Um, but you just focus on that. I just focus on whatever it is I'm saying in the column and stick with that and shut the world out. And, uh, you know, just by circumstance, you know, I, I worked in Washington for a long time. And in 2004, my my dad was coming down with Alzheimer's. And so it was pretty clear I had to come home. So I moved back here to where they live. And um, uh, he passed in 2007. And my mother uh, passed in uh, 2018. But in the doing of this, I brought all the stuff I had in Washington, you know, all these bookcases and all of my books, my presidential books from Washington now to Biden and, uh, you know, books on everything and i just you know sort of remade the place uh so that i can sit here now and talk to you um i'm on the pen live editorial board so you know we do zoom calls with that on occasion um i uh, i do my newsmax hits from here and uh you know god bless the 21st century you know mm -hmm. you can you can make an impact and as I say, social media lets just about anybody out there make an impact. And and the, and the other thing you learn is that things move pretty fast. And you know, if 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 you had some sort of an incident today, but about twenty minutes after it was reported, it would be forgotten. <laughs> right. Right. So you know, I never worry about that. You know, you just uh, you just do what you got to do, and and on you go. How would you describe Donald Trump? Well, based on my personal experience, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll tell you the tale of my first exposure to him. I had written and I, I had gotten a note in 2013 from somebody who was then working for him, who was a friend of a friend of mine. And he had seen something in the American Spectator that he didn't like and that Trump didn't like. And the title of the piece was uh, the, the writer had seen Trump on the Today Show with Matt Lauer. And again, this is like June of 2013. And, and Matt Lauer says to him, are you thinking of running for president in 2016? And Trump says, yes, he is. So this guy at The Spectator writes a column, can't we just ignore Donald Trump? And goes on to say, you know, he's always saying this and it's just, BS and you know let's not pay any attention to him I hadn't seen it and and I open up my email and there's this thing from this guy who works for Trump and the and the tagline was Jeffrey this is BS <laughs> I thought well what's this so I read the article and I thought 
Well, I'll answer that because I don't know Donald Trump, but I certainly know his career a bit and I've read his books. And I, I think, you know, I think he's a very interesting person and he could get elected. So I wrote this column, Never Ignore Donald Trump. And pretty quickly, in comes a note to the American Spectator, a thank you note to me. Well, that's nice, but I didn't think too much of it. Then a little later, it comes to my attention that the then Attorney General of New York, Eric Schneiderman by name, who later had to resign in disgrace, um, was investigating Trump. And I thought, you know, this this doesn't smell right. You know, th this is a very ambitious politician who wants to be governor of New York. Something's going on here. And I check around and find out that sure enough, he'd been to Trump for money. He got a donation. He didn't think it was enough and wanted more. He went to Jared and Ivanka and wanted big bucks and wasn't satisfied and basically sort of kicked the tires of their company and said, you know, nice story you got here. You wouldn't want anything to happen to it. And I looked into him some more and found out that he had this habit of doing that kind of thing with all sorts of people in New York that had zero connection to Donald Trump. So I wrote a column called Shakedown Schneiderman <laughs> and went through these episodes one by one by one. So sometime after that, I'm sitting here at home at my desk on a Saturday of Labor Day weekend. And my mom is then in her 90s, you know, sound asleep in the other room. The phone rings. And I always say, you know how you, you, you'll hear a voice sometime and you know you know the voice and you can't quite place it. And I pick up the phone. Jeffrey, yes, this is Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> and I was stunned. You know, I laughed. First, I said, Donald, you didn't have to call. Well, we talked for 15 and 20 minutes. And he says, OK, now you got my number. Call me anytime. Well, we got a couple months later in the American Spectator, unbeknownst to me, we, we have this big glitzy dinner run by the American Spectator Foundation every year in Washington, in which we always have some political celebrity of the day give a speech. And they selected for 2013, Donald Trump and Ted Cruz with another with an appearance by the actor Gary Sinise. And, you know, great evening and, and to come and all that sort of thing. And I'm sitting here in Harrisburg, which is, you know, a couple hours north of Washington. And I get this call from uh, Trump's office saying, Mr. Trump wants you to fly down to Washington with him. I said, well, let me get back to you. And I'm I'm thinking the logistics here, you know, what do I do with mom? And, you know, I, I'm just two hours from D.C. He's in New York. And by chance, one of my girl cousins, as I call her, calls me to check on my mother. And I said, Beth, you'll never believe it. I just got a call from Donald Trump's office asking me to fly down to Washington with him. And she says, well, you're going to do it, aren't you? <laughs> so. She says, I know the problem. I'll come down there and take care of your mother. You go do this. So I drove to D.C. at the crack of dawn, parked the car where the event was that night, took the train to New York, walked into Trump Tower. And if you've never been in Trump Tower, the lobby area and the basement area are just filled with shops for the public, restaurants, you know, all of which bear his name in some fashion. And I had a little time to kill. So I walk into the back of the I'm walking through and in the back, there's a men's tie counter. And I thought, well, this looks interesting and then i realized what the prices were <laughs> and i thought well maybe not hmm. maybe no souvenir so it's time to go upstairs and they they whisk me up to his office and he's in there uh he had opened a golf course in the bronx the day before and uh was looking at pictures with, of himself with jack nicholas and mayor bloomberg and you know bronx politicians it was one of those typical stories where the city of new york had been trying for years to get it done couldn't and went to him and he got it done so he shows me these and then says, all right, come upstairs with me while I uh, change my shirt. And uh, and then we'll, we're, we're going to take the citation, he says, my citation jet. He says, it's smaller than the 757 and Al Gore is always giving me grief. <laughs> hmm. He says, you know, it'll be faster. So I go up and is with his security guard and with him and the security guard, he's got the top three floors. The security guard is showing me around. And as I always say, just like your place in mine, marble floors, uh, you know, frescoes on the ceiling, the faucets in the bathroom were solid gold. <laughs> it was, it was amazing to behold. So then he's ready. We, we go down and we come out in a back lobby that's parallel to the public lobby. And obviously this was for the people who live and work there. And, uh, 
we're almost out the door to the limo. And he says, oh, wait, wait, Jeff, come with me. Takes me by the arm. We go out into the public lobby and my political brain realizes instantly he was swarmed, just mobbed by people mm. who suddenly realize he's in their midst and they want selfies and they, you know, autographs and all this kind of, he takes me over to the Kai, Kai counter and says, pick one. <laughs> nice. I said, no, he says, pick one. So I pick one. He says, pick another. <laughs> I pick another. So I pick a second one. And then he turns to the girl behind the counter and says, okay, and give him, uh, give him that one. And uh, yeah, give him that one there. And oh yes, give him one of those up there. Well, one of those up there turned out to be men's cologne. Um, uh, what was it? Uh, success by Trump. <laughs> <laughs> So with that, we we climb in the car and and go out to LaGuardia Airport to the private plane section there, or hop in his plane, and um, we sit in the back just by ourselves. And and the only other people on the plane is his staff member that was with him, and uh, he sits in the cockpit with the pilot. And so we're the two of us are just chatting away and talking about all kinds of things. So we're in the car. We get we get to the airport. We're we're, we're uh, chatting away on the plane. We did indeed get there in, you know, like 30 minutes. It was amazing. Um, but when we're getting ready to land, he he turns and starts to get up and he says, I'm going to go comb my hair. And then he sits down and he says, you know, I don't get the fascination with the hair. He says, Barbara Walters wants to touch my hair. Greta Van Susteren wants to touch my hair. And he goes like this. It's his hair, without doubt. Pulls it back like this so I can see. And he says, you know... I'm worth $10 billion with that much money. Don't you think if this was a toupee, I couldn't get a better one. <laughs> <laughs> I burst out laughing. I, you know, so we, we, we sort of established that kind of relationship and uh, uh, he would call every once in a while. I'd get notes. He wanted to know what I was doing here as opposed to back in Washington. And I told him, you know, taking care of my mother and all that sort of thing. And he says, you know, that just, he says, that tells me everything I need to know about you. He says, most guys ditch their mothers. <laughs> hmm. And uh, uh, so it was just great. And I would go up periodically and see him. And I did a, an interview with him for the American Spectator in 2014, I think it was. And uh, periodically I'd get, notes from him and all of that sort of thing so um it just became it became terrific and then when he when he ran for president uh, i wrote a, a column uh for the spectator yes trump can win and went on to uh illustrate all the people who thought that ronald reagan could never win <laughs> <laughs> and uh there were a lot of them you know and i i found the quotes and I mean, I remembered this, but, you know, you got to document it and all that kind of thing. And I thought, you know, what's really going on here is he's an outsider. And you've got all these people in what has become known as the swamp, uh, who it's like a club, you know, and I worked there for a long time. And, you know, it's very, uh, it, it reminds me, and Washington reminds me in a way of junior high school, you know, where there's the, there's the athletes there's the student council types and, you know, they're in some sort of in crowd with the cheerleaders and all that kind of thing. And then there's just the regular kids that, you know, aren't, and they're sort of on the outs, right? They're, they're not invited to the parties and all of that kind of thing. And I thought, you know, Washington DC bears an interesting resemblance hmm. to that sort of thing. So, uh, so, you know, ever after, and I got a, a invitation to the inaugural and, inaugural ball and all of that kind of stuff and uh then eventually when it was when he was there and would have a christmas party i'd go or christmas parties plural as presidents do i would get to go to one of them i went to one and i looked across the room and there was rush limbaugh <laughs> hmm. whom i knew you know and and uh it was good to see him and all that and i think now how poignant that <laughs> that was in in retrospect um but it was, you know, it was great. So to this moment, we we stay in touch, and and uh, uh, I have a, a great time and a lot of respect for him. Uh, he's a very smart guy, and uh, most Washington people uh, think inside the box, 
And because of who he is and what he's accomplished, he thinks outside the box. I mean, you know, this little thing the other day with the trading cards and all these people jumping, oh, and it's undignified and it's this, that, and the other thing. Well, I, I vividly remember that when President Ford, you know, left office, um, some of these same people were aghast that he joined a, a corporate board. You know, how 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 dare he make money? And when President Reagan left, uh, he was paid, you know, several thousand, tens of thousands of dollars to go somewhere and give a speech. And they jumped on him for this. Well, this is his version of this. I mean, he's out of office. Uh, this is not a speech. This is trading cards. He's inventive. He's creative. And I, I just, I personally think that's what this country needs, among other things. You know, we're just doing the same old, same old, same old, just particularly when it doesn't work <laughs> is is not good. I was thinking when the, the card thing came out, uh, is this a good idea, a bad idea? And I thought, well, if people buy them, it's obviously a good idea. And they sold out, <laughs> right? Yeah. They sold. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, it, it really does amaze me how out of touch some of his critics are with what goes on in America and average life and average Americans and all of this kind of thing. And they have this real loathing of him, which, I, I mean, I, I just... I don't get it. I mean, knowing him in person, you know, and he would call me on a house, mom, say hi to mom, that mm. kind of, I mean, that's a, that's a sensitive human being who realizes there are other people on the planet and they all have problems and, and all of that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I've had other people who know him, uh, tell stories. And there was one story that I read, uh, that he was, he was going along the street in New York. This is well before he ran for president. And uh, there was some guy there who was having, he had apparently a flat tire and was struggling, couldn't get the thing done. And and Trump stops, gets out of the car, goes over there, calls AAA or somebody to come and do this and pays for the tire, <laughs> the new tire. I mean, just typical of exactly the kind of person he is and and i i feel i i feel in one way really badly because uh these people on the inside have used i mean they're criminalizing politics basically uh they, they've gone after him for his private life his taxes his i mean this that and the other thing and it just never it just never stops and uh some days i wonder how he and I said this to him at one point. I, I was in in to see him uh, with a couple colleagues from the American Spectator in November of night of 2019, and you know we talked for about an hour, issues and all this kind of thing. And then when we were done, he he, he says, uh, I said to him, you know, Mr. President, I was I was here for President Reagan, and I was there as a matter of fact during the whole Iran Contra situation, and wow. President Reagan had his critics, but I said, it, it just was nothing like what these people are doing to you. And uh, I don't know how you put up with it, frankly, but he, you know, he just soldiers on. And uh, I did a piece the other week. He, he wrote a book, which I think is key, which is typical of, of him. It was called Never Give Up. And uh, it talks about, this was before, he was, well before he was president. And it's about his adventures and misadventures in new york and all of this kind of thing and people who tell him you know donald you can't do x and then he goes out of his way to get x accomplished and he had a list of 10 things you know what, what things like stay focused that he would always remind himself stay focused don't let the critics get you down you know all this kind of thing and i thought the other week i thought you know this is what's going on people don't seem to get the deal here they can do this to him all day long. He's got this ability to focus and just stay on things. And he's not going to get let down by people saying, oh, you can't win. You can't do this. You can't do that. I mean, he's heard some version of this kind of thing his entire life. And uh, he's done pretty well. Looking at the photo behind you of Ronald Reagan. Yeah. The, the actor and singer 
Robert Davi has made comparisons to Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump. Could yes. you make any comparisons between the two? Yes, both were seen as outsiders uh, without question. Um, and when President Reagan, first of all, all kinds of political wise men in the day said that Ronald Reagan could never get elected. I remember reading a New York Times story in 1965. And if you remember the tale in October, I think it was October 27th of 1964, he gave that famous, what is now called time for choosing speech for Barry Goldwater. And, you know, Goldwater loses in a landslide. And then suddenly people realize that Reagan should run for governor of California. And the Republican establishment of the day is appalled in California, is absolutely appalled at this. So the New York Times writes up this article and quotes various Republicans on and off the record that what a disaster. He'd lose in a landslide, you know, yada, yada, yada. And uh, of course, he he runs and <laughs> wins the primary over the, believe it or not, San Francisco had a Republican mayor, albeit a liberal one. George Christopher, I think, was his name. And Reagan wins in the primary. So now he's in the runoff in the fall election with Pat Brown, who'd been Jerry's father, you know, who, who himself had been twice governor, attorney general, all that kind of thing, and a real sort of machine Democrat. <laughs> he runs a commercial where he's looking into the camera and he says, Ronald Reagan is an actor, pause, beat. And you know who shot Lincoln, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, backfire, big time. Reagan wins in a million vote landslide, and um, and then you know was immediately projected as a potential presidential possibility. And that's when all sorts of people in the Republican establishment, and you know, as I say, I've gone back. People with names like Nelson Rockefeller. Um, Senator Charles Percy from Illinois, Jacob Javits from New York, uh, others said there just wasn't a prayer in the world that he he could be elected president. He's he's too extreme. Um, he's way out there on the far right. Gerald Ford in particular was saying things like this and, of course, defeats him in a gigantic battle in 1976 and wins the nomination. Ford wins the nomination and then he loses the election. And uh, loses, lost my home state of Pennsylvania, and I was in the on the campaign staff here. And uh, four years later, it's it's Reagan versus Bush, and the same people were saying the same thing: don't nominate him because he'll lose. Well, he gets nominated, and he wins in a forty-four state landslide. <laughs> and four years after that, he runs for re-election and gets elected in a forty-nine state landslide. So. Uh, I just see the similarities here. Reagan was an outsider. Uh, the establishment club of the Republican Party was not fond of him, made it known. Uh, once elected, uh, Republicans in, in certain places in the Senate and elsewhere would give him grief and all this kind of thing. And I, I just I do see a similarity with President Reagan. And uh, and I used to not only tell that to to Trump himself, but when I would go on CNN, I would say it. And as a matter of fact, when when Trump won in 2016, he did a a thank you tour. And this is somewhere else. Somebody put this up on YouTube, not I. But so he comes to Hershey, which is about 20 miles from here, and comes to the uh, the Hershey Convention Center, which is you know a huge place where the Hershey Hershey Bears hockey team plays and all this, and has about ten thousand people in it. And he and Mike Pence come in, and uh, they give me a front row seat. And I don't know that he knew it, but when he walks in, he sees me. So he's going on in his speech about you know this, that, and the other thing, and and then he he for some reason he gets to what happened in Utah and that he'd carried Utah. And he says, I forget, what's the last time? And then he turns around and says to me, Jeffrey, when's the last time a Republican carried Utah for president? And, 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 then, and then he doesn't even let me answer. He says, he says, don't you love him? He's on CNN all the time and they're giving all the stuff. I hope he's getting paid a lot of money <laughs> for, for this. And then, uh, uh, God, he, he, he went on with all of this. And my, and my point just is, 
he has a great relationship with people. The crowd loved him. Oh, oh, and that's what I was going to say was Reagan. He said, uh, he's always comparing me to Ronald Reagan. That's not so bad, is it? <laughs> the crowd goes nuts. <laughs> and I did. I did, because I really did see the similarity. I mean, Reagan was an outsider and he was an outsider. And uh, they were up against the Republican establishment. And uh, Reagan won and Trump won. And, and I still see it's a big deal. And that battle is not, the battle is not only not over, but whatever happens to Trump, in 2024, this is going to go on. And uh, if, in fact, Governor DeSantis runs down the road after a second Trump term or when Trump decides not to run or whatever, uh, you're going to see the same thing. All these people who are clutching it at his coattails uh, will turn on him, on, will turn on DeSantis in a dime and, you know, they'll start savaging him like they went after Trump. Uh, so that that battle, which began in a way with Reagan taking uh taking away the control of the Republican party from the, the so-called country club set, as it were. Um, this battle is going to go on for a long time post Trump. I'm, I, I'm convinced of that. And, you know, the Republican party changed. Um, Reagan made it a working class party, uh, which was interesting because when I was a kid, the Democrats were as Franklin Roosevelt said, the party of the forgotten man. And, uh, Republicans were seen as country clubbers, literally, <laughs> and all of that. And they were to a considerable degree. And now it's totally flipped. I mean, the Democratic Party has got all these hedge fund managers and Wall Street types and, you know, elites here, there and everywhere. And the Republican Party has got the average working guy uh, on the street. And, and it's a fascinating sort of long term political thing. But I think it was started by Reagan and really amplified by Trump. And I think DeSantis is set to carry that on at some point or somebody else, you know, but, uh, and f figures of the moment, those are the ones involved. Fascinating. Do you think that there are any misconceptions about you? Oh yeah. I mean, people, you know, when I was a kid, as I said, I was a big, uh, fan of president Kennedy and, uh, Robert Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, and I'm not sure people really are aware of all of that. And it's still a big deal to me. Um, when Robert Kennedy was killed, I was 17 and I was grief stricken, uh, you know, and I, I had uh, just been elected president of my student council and all this by in part, because I knew how to imitate Bobby Kennedy and uh, uh I was just, it was awful. And my parents, of course, good Republicans by now we're living in Pennsylvania in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And good old mom gets on a bus with me and we go from Allentown to New York city. So I can stand in line to go by the casket in St. Patrick's cathedral and, you know, touch the flag on the casket, that sort of thing. Um, and I'm not sure people get the deal. Uh, about this but uh you know i i just as i as time has moved on with me i mean i was reaganized without doubt uh and and still am and uh i see the people that i have worked for john hines was you know the senior senator from pennsylvania and he was in the day seen as a moderate republican and after i went to work in the white house and uh i had to do an event for john and and we're riding along in a car and and uh he was saying to me this is about 1987 that uh he's becoming more conservative that he john hines was becoming more conservative and that sort of materialized in the big confirmation battle over robert bork and uh john voted for robert bork to the vast disappointment of some of his liberal Republican friends. Um, but he really took this seriously. And, and I just think that the the party in general was sort of Reaganized and Trumpized, if you will, and it's there for somebody else down the road. And so, I, but I think most people out there don't know that about me in terms of uh, this, you know, I have uh, pictures of, you know, my heroes here, Winston Churchill, and I know Newt Gingrich, uh, in, in the small world department, Newt is originally from Har the Harrisburg area. 
And when I ran for the legislature, when I was a dopey 25 year old, I ran for Republican nomination and lost. It was a close one, but I lost in a Republican district. And um, for I, I lost the nomination. But my campaign treasurer was one Roberta Brown, whose middle name is Gingrich. And she is, yes, indeed, one of Newt's sisters. And she was saying to me, this is 1976 now, she says, oh, you got to meet my brother. He's running for Congress in Georgia. I mean, you'd really, you'd really get along with him. He's terrific. Well, he runs that year and loses. He runs in 1978 and wins. And lo and behold, becomes a key part, a creator of what was known as the Conservative Opportunity Society. And I'm by then a White House political director for President Reagan. And I get assigned to be the liaison for this. So every Tuesday, uh, I'd go up to Capitol Hill to then Texas Congressman Dick Armey's office, I think it was, or somebody else's office. And there was Newt Gingrich and Jack Kemp, who I would later work for, and all of these conservative Republican members, not unlike today's House Freedom Caucus. And uh, so I got to know Newt a little bit and, and saw him. Um, he was the speaker, the keynote speaker at our American Spectator dinner this year. So uh, out of sight here, there's a picture of me when he was the House Republican whip. And then there's another one of me just the other week, which uh, sort of is amazing. Time uh, time moves on. But uh, you never know when you're going to meet people that, you know, you're going to have some connection to and all of that kind of thing. Hmm. Very, very true. You mentioned earlier in the interview that you're friends with Anderson Cooper. Yeah. And I'm curious. Tell us about what kind of mistake you think it is when somebody can't be friends with someone who has a differing view or is in a different political party. And how can we how can we all be friends? Yeah, I, I it just I, and I got this from my parents. Uh, as I say, their best friends were Democrats and, and active Democrats. The the husband was the. Uh, was a deputy sheriff in Northampton and his wife was very active. Their two teenage daughters were my babysitters <laughs> and they were great friends as were, as they were with the, uh, the lawyer and his wife who lived next door and they were all friends and they too were serious Democrats, but they had a great time together. They had a lot of respect for one another. Um, they were great friends in my larger extended family. I have a lot of, um, uh, liberals, Democrats. And, you know, when I was a kid, we'd get into these political discussions and uh, all that, but they were after all my family. And I just, you know, the older I've gotten, I just don't understand how you can't be friends with somebody just because they have different politics than yours. As, as I often say, there's more to life than politics. And, you know, once you get rid of, not rid of, but once you're done thinking about political issue of the day, you know, you got to make dinner, you got to have friends, you got you go out with people, you, you're with family, you, you, you know, there are things that have absolutely nothing to do whatsoever with politics. And I just think it's uh, always a good thing to focus on. And, you know, everybody is an individual. And, um, you know, you get, you get criticism if you're doing A, B, or C. I mean, I remember the criticism from some of my liberal family members when I was working for President Reagan. <laughs> and we'd be gathered in my grandmother's kitchen and Reagan had done, and as a matter of fact, it might've been the Iran-Contra year. They were beating me over the head for that. But, you know, they were my aunts and uncles and and uh, and I loved them. And, you know, you just, you have the conversation and you move on and there's other stuff. So uh, I just think it's important never to let politics determine your 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 friendships and relationships in life what is the best thing about being jeffrey lord about having <laughs> about having the perspectives and the experiences that you've had well i must say at this at this stage of my life i'm amazed i mean you can't see it here other than back here but i i have all this memorabilia and pictures of people um, you know, I, I'm looking at the, I, when I, when I was 17 in 1968, after Robert Kennedy died, m my father, 
uh, helped get me an appointment as a page to the Republican National Convention in Miami Beach. <coughs> so I have the certificate from the then Republican chairman, whose name was Ray Bliss. And that in turn, when news of that got out, the uh, Allentown Evening Chronicle cartoonist did a weekly thing with events of the week and all that. And there is my 17 year old self riding an elephant <laughs> and mm -hmm. saying, you know, call, I think his name was multi France, who was the local Lehigh County Republican chairman. And then, you know, on it goes here. I mean, over here, I have a piece of the Berlin wall. I, I didn't go to Berlin with president Reagan, but I was certainly in the white house at the time. And, uh, you know, I heard all the stories when he when he came back and, you know, the famous business about Mr. Gorbachev come to tear down this wall. He was in the limo on his way to the uh, Berlin Wall to give his speech. And that line had been inserted by one of the speechwriters whom I knew. And the uh, State Department types were appalled and took it out after Reagan had seen it. And. And then somebody put it back in and they took it out again. Now he's literally in the back of his presidential limo with my friend, Ken Duberstein, who was sadly now passed away, but he was then the White House chief of staff. And Reagan is looking at the copy in his hand. And he says, should I put this back in? And Ken, to his everlasting credit, says, Mr. President, sir, you're the president. <laughs> <laughs> with that it goes back in delivers that line and that turns out to be one of the most famous uh and well thought of lines of his entire eight years and the berlin wall eventually did get down torn down um so you think of things like that and then you know all these things i mean there's my uh uh a picture over there it was a note from from donald trump's staff in 2016 or 15, I guess it was. And uh, it, it says, Mr. Trump asked you to see the following. And I look below when there's a line. Um, I suggest you do Anderson Cooper when asked. And I'm thinking, Anderson Cooper? I, I'm going to get asked to do Anderson Cooper show. And he signs it, love Donald. And uh, uh, within a, a day or half a day, sure enough, I get a call asking me to go on with Anderson Cooper. And so I do this for like two weeks in a row. And uh, yeah, I'd get somebody from my church to sit with my mother and I would drive across the river. To, there's a PBS station there where the where CNN and Fox and MSNBC, if they've got a Pennsylvania guest, they zoom in there. And so I would go over there, do Anderson's show and then come back. And after two weeks of this, I come home and there's a note on my email you know please call you know somebody at cnn and i do and they said we want to hire you we think this is great so i get i get uh i get hired and uh uh you know it was it was a life-changing experience i mean things that i would never have thought of in my life i'm getting profiled by vanity fair and the hollywood reporter <laughs> and all of this kind of stuff and getting recognized everywhere I go. And, and, you know, I'd get into these on air back and forth with, uh, with Van Jones and we became great friends, but we, you know, obviously disagreed and good Lord, we'd, we'd go walking down the street together and you would have thought it was the Beatles. I mean, people are <laughs> looking and pointing and I mean, it was a, it was an interesting experience. So uh, all because of Donald Trump, you know, and it's uh uh, I have a great time with him, but I, you know, I, I haven't heard from Anderson in quite a while and he's busy now, you know, he's got two little boys and, uh, good for him. You know, he's, uh, he's great. So I have this sort of, uh, eclectic, uh, group of people over here on the side of, you know, I've been on with Bill Maher and, and, uh, there I am with Joe Piscopo from Saturday night live, uh, came to dinner and, uh, it's he and myself and, Kaylee McEnany, pre-press secretary days and uh, other things, you know, subbing for Sean and and at a dinner with uh, Rush Limbaugh and, you know, on with Tucker. So, you know, it's just lots of memories there, but you got to stay rooted, you know, and I'm glad uh, in a way I've often thought I'm glad it, it happened when I was older hmm. because you can see why if, if you're 20 something 
and you get all that kind of attention, people can go off the rails with it and and the pressure becomes too much and they get a big head and all that kind of thing. And, you know, been there, <laughs> been through my youth, done that. And uh, so now it's just, uh, you know, I sit down every day and write my columns and Skype in for Newsmax and uh, do a radio show. And as I say, by chance, I'm precisely because, uh, I mean, the Hannity people know me well enough to know that I go out to Long Island for Christmas. So, uh, you know, I'm on my way to New York anyway, and this is Sean's traditional uh, time out. He goes down, I think he goes to Florida uh, and he has a place down there. So uh, they've been having uh, different guest hosts. I don't know who's on today, as a matter of fact, seeing that it's uh, already half a half hour into a show. But uh, yesterday it was Peter Schweitzer. And uh, before that, it was uh, my friend Rose Tennant, who's a radio host in Pittsburgh. And uh, whoever it is today and tomorrow, and then I'm on the dock for Thursday. So, Well, Jeffrey Lord, thank you so much for being our last guest of 2022. You bet. It's been great Enjoy to it. visit with you. I, I really enjoyed it. I hope we get to meet in person someday. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it is it is always good to meet in person. I, last week uh, when I was in New York, uh, I went for something called the Pennsylvania Society, which is a long deal. It's been going on for over 100 years and all of this kind of thing. But following that, I went to a Newsmax TV Christmas party. And, uh, you know, there were several hundred people there and, and, you know, I'm on Newsmax all the time, but it is great to see the people I'm on with in the flesh up close and be able to talk to them and, uh, all of that kind of thing. So it, it, it is always good to meet people in person and, um, uh, and chat and all of that kind of thing. So there is a future. I have, a, I have a, a hunch, Paul, that, uh, 2023 and 2024 there will be a lot of activity so if you need to chat <laughs> just holler <laughs> I'm, I'm already looking forward to it but i'll just give you the last words of 2022 totally open-ended we you know we have people from all over the the world in some cases tune in what would you like to say to anyone out there well i still say merry christmas and uh and also happy new year and uh you know, it's a good time to reflect on whatever's going on in your life. And uh, if you want to make any changes to something, uh, focus on the changes. Uh, you know, one of the most common ones, people say, well, I'm going to lose X pounds and I'm going to exercise. And then sometimes they get about a week into the <laughs> routine and right. it sort of falls by the wayside. Stay focused. Uh, stay focused on what you're doing and and know what you want to do. And then go do it. Don't, don't let, you know, there will always be naysayers that'll tell you, uh, give you a thousand reasons why you can't accomplish A, B, or C. Don't go down that road. As I always say, run your head. Very good. All right, sir. All right. Thanks a lot, Paul. Until next time. Talk again. Yep. Bye-bye. You know, the Paul Leslie Hour is made possible by people like you, listeners, viewers, please, Go to thepaulleslie.com slash support, and you'll know what to do when you're there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who contributes. Performance of The Entertainer intro song by John Primerano. And, of course, this is your announcer speaking. See you next time on The Paul Leslie Hour.